there is the introduction of a pathogen, for instance. So this, we have information about the absence and the presence. This uh, gives us information in the different circumstances, clinically speaking. But if we don't understand what a disease causes to a species, you cannot establish the differences in risk. So the pathogen doesn't mean a disease. It's only a disease when you have clinical uh, signals, mortality, loss of survival capacity, reproduction capacity. Basically, these are the factors. So we need uh, information about pathogenicity, infectology, how it is transmitted, what it affects, what is its transmission sort of uh, vessels. Because if you have a pathogen that is uh, vector, needs vector X to transmit this in the uh, environment, then we don't have the risk. So we need to you know, think about what are we talking about as far as the disease concerned, its transition process and what process does it go through in order to remain in an unknown environment. Okay, so I've only really uh, gone for some examples of some papers that we've done throughout the years, not me, but uh, that some uh, researchers in Brazil. And we have information today on different surveys. So we have energetic disease, okay, which is a virus. So the herpes virus, this is something that we've been looking for because it is an important um, disease for swine. So you're going to use this pathogen possibly for the peccaries, you know? So you have a study that shows low and high prevalence in uh, animals living in the wildlife. There are studies showing this prevalence in animals in captivity, not the prevalence, but the presence. We have also uh, seen this, uh, the Maria St. Michael uh, virus. So we have uh, circa virus. So we have all these different uh, evidence that the disease kind of goes through this. We have some um, organisms responding to this through serology, and we have some evidence through molecules. Okay, this says that the organism was there, but none of these papers bring any pathogen related uh, information because these again with viruses we can talk about bacterial diseases it is important to emphasize uh, brucella which has uh, propped up in some papers uh, uh, work done by solar in peru with prevalence of 11 to 58 percent of course very near different conservation units and this actually helps us to understand a little bit that if we're talking about its sort of sampling site, we have a very high prevalence of this disease. Again, you have a site much lower. And this is why landscape is more important for that environment, you know? For that landscape, this disease has more relevance than any other landscape, for example. So these are diseases that we would have to kind of weigh out if we're talking about the translocation of the white lip peccaries. Okay, I need to concern myself with them. So we have a number of different prerogatives to understand. Do we have a clinical sign? I have a number of different diseases. And you think, mm, I'm never going to get to a conclusion. But it's not that complex, really, because if you're going to analyze this, you need to look at this disease and see what it represents within the species context and in the program that you're working in. So, for example, you have uh, you know, high uh, prevalence as far as these other diseases are concerned. But then what is the clinical sort of casework behind this? Can this lead to, uh, you know, a loss of, I don't know, 1%, 10% of the population, 0.01%, you know? This is the fact that needs to be taken into account, the disease vis-a-vis -vis what you can actually represent, even if it's an inference or if you have a more apply dancer for that situation for that pathogen for that species you can have a more precise uh, value in the modeling okay in modeling we also have sort of inferred error however the more sort of information that you have the smaller your mistake so possibly the toxicoplasmosis has a prevalence of 70 percent in a sort of wildlife population of you know peccaries could be more relevant because you understand what is the clinical problem this disease has vis-a-vis -a, -vis a number of species that you know for example so is this uh, usually very low so you're going to think okay is this disease relevant or not? And then for that, you need to think, you know, on a pathogen by pathogen basis, okay, to think about the 
species that you're studying. So for example, uh, then you go through a different category. So we know what's there, we imagine what could actually happen. So we have, you know, the blue tongue disease, vesicular stomatitis, equine encephalitis. So these up until now, we've not seen in uh, peccaries, okay? Foot and mouth disease, tuberculosis, uh, swine plague. I mean, this is something that we've not actually had an extension of the studies yet, but when it was actually researched, it was not actually found. And then you have other cases. Synomosis, which is a carnival disease in uh, wildlife peccaries in North America. So you have a number of different bits of information to work on thinking about the relevance. You have a number of clinical uh, descriptions also, cosidiomycosis, trinchinella. You need to think about, okay, in captivity, okay, there is that, there's a problem. What about conservation? What's the problem with this uh, a disease in a sort of free population, free life, wildlife population? Can it be a problem? You know, we know that uh, uh, all different diseases can have uh, problems as far as this wildlife uh, is concerned. You know, scabies, scabies, for instance. So you need to look at all these different diseases to understand which one is um, relevant for the species that you're concerned with and the landscape that you are concerned with. You have some other uh, non infectious diseases. You have, I don't know, feeding, food related issues. You have, you know, appropriate conditions or not. Is uh, this uh, a species subject to other external factors, you know? pollutants, for instance, you know. So here you need to try and find this uh, information to try and understand what type of evidence helps you understand whether or not this is an important disease. As I said, when you have uh, data on the presence or the absence of pathogens, okay? So we have, you know, the clinical manifestation of the diseases where we have the least amount of information available. When you do have available information is, you know, captivity animals, which again, may not have a direct uh, uh, effect on wildlife animals. I mean, of course it could be uh, dangerous, but you know, what happens in the wildlife, is it the same that happens in captivity? Possibly, but we don't know, but we need to think about this when we're talking about translocation. And then how did we work on the process of trying to understand that disease a little bit more within conservation? We need to understand that there are criteria that we can refer to as eligible criteria for categorizing risk for conservation other species so you have those risks you know so we need to say what is more or less important in relation to a certain disease okay for a certain species for its conservation so when we're talking about you know translocation process of so the morbidity of the disease, what's the possibility of my spread, the mortality, le lethal uh, rate, what are the processes that it changes the organism that it produces? Does it have reproductive effects? Does it have an effect on the production rate of the population? Its capacity to disseminate in the environment, the uh, disease ecology in relation to other species is important risk factor, the relation that this disease has with uh, agents and some other sort of environmental degradation drivers, you know. So issues that are not directly linked to the pathogen, but how does it establish itself in the environment? And we also need to take into consideration the economic, political, and social aspects, you know, factor of that disease. I think that a very clear example of that is foot and mouth disease. It is a much more important disease, economically speaking, for a lot of the species than in relation to the survival of a species throughout time, because it may not be very important as far as survival aspects is concerned, but it can be a very important disease as far as social pressure on that species. So, you know, for example, we release uh, this white lip peccaries and then we start having a lot of these diseases, which is an important factor, uh, economically speaking, politically speaking, and that is associated to a native species. And if there's native species associated to that disease, in a way or another, we know that the impact can be actually much here. So we need to think about these criteria to think, okay, what's more important on a disease when we need to use it, have it as a risk factor or not? So this sort of risk factor is not just biological, it is uh, social, it is environmental, okay? And then when you add to all of this, and here we can try, sorry, this kind of froze up a bit, um, but here we can try, 
okay, a link to this, sorry. This risk, uh, not just infectious risk of, you know, infectious diseases, but we have some other epidemiologic risk factors which have to do with the uh, landscape, you know, uh, segregation, uh, conservation unit, what's the matrix around that area that you're working in, okay? This brings in other risk factors, such as environmental risk. Yeah, sorry guys, my computer is uh, locking up for some reason, freezing up for some reason. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, okay, I'm using your pause to say that you have five minutes. Yeah, no, this is great because this is just through some other factors that we need to address. So, uh, environmental fragmentation that can lead to, you know, a higher populational density, health and biodiversity. But this is also an environmental stress aspect, okay? Because the more fragmented the environment, the higher stress that the individuals of that species are suffering as a consequence, there is a higher sort of frailty vis-a-vis -vis health for that uh, species. When there's a more stressful environment, the trend for those individuals is to have a lower level of health. And this comes from the matrix that comes from your work area be it, you know, a conservation unit or, or where you're working on epidemiologic risk. Factor has to do with the matrix of proximity, proximity with native species. Okay, so here we have a boar, a feral, uh, a pig, okay, and then you can see a bat uh, feeding from it. So this process where we have non wild species, okay, domesticated uh, uh, species that have great biomass in the uh, a system they're going to have an influence on the pathogens or the capacity of that pathogen to remain in that uh, environment so that pathogen can be higher or lower risk for the species that we're interested in so this factor where you have the presence of a big domestic uh, species biomass uh, presence this has to do you know populational density domesticated animals the spill over uh, effect where we have the pathogens that goes through a domesticated animal so this is like an epidemic and then suddenly that pathogen hits a wild species, wildlife species that had nothing to do with that uh, previous uh, population. This has to do with the landscape, but it also has to do with the landscape uh, biological profile. Something which is difficult for us to work on uh, is chemical pollution, okay, through contaminants from agriculture, which is the most important one when we talk about uh, uh, nature conservation with the species that we work with. Basically speaking, we have environmental contamination sort of uh, stress points can lead to a number of endocrinal uh, intoxication, immunological uh, problems, and all of this may have an effect on the population's viability throughout time. Okay, finally, we have uh, biological invasions, which is also an important factor. So we have, you know, the entrance of a new agent in an environment is going to bring pathogens. They're going to bring new ways that these pathogens are going to work on. So basically speaking, the uh, biological invasions, they tend to reduce natural biological diversity at the same time. And this has an important consequence, which is what, you know, the dilution effect where you have a set a bigger set of biological sort of diversity, which is a bit of a rule. And then when you have a sort of more untouched, if you will, uh, biological uh, 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 diversity in that ecosystem, you have an effect where the pathogens are diluted within this sort of series of uh, species. Because when you have a species, and then the deformation process, and then you have a sort of general kind of species. Their species can also be a factor for disseminating the pathogen, we can, which can also be important uh, for the uh, eventually uh, endangered species. So this biological sort of biomass is going to help so that these uh, uh, pathogens do not have such a damaging effect on the uh, populations. And biodiversity, I mean, in addition to all the different roles it plays, it has the role of uh, keeping the the health of an ecosystem also. So there's a number of factors, okay, and I wanted to go very quickly for us to be able to understand the complexity here. But uh, at the same time that I believe that this is complex, I do believe that uh, this is very important too, because when we come to this question, I have a key species, I have a specific landscape, okay? I 
have a sort of a judgment of value between the risk of doing something or the risk of not doing anything. And then you have a number of diseases that you need to concern yourselves with. But if we sit down and really analyze all the diseases, the landscape issues for certain projects, it could be that at the end of the day, you end up with two, three diseases that you need to worry about. And then you need to run a viability analysis based on this to try and understand that the risk is not actually that high. Because if we look at the pathogens, we're going to find them. But if we look for diseases, a lot of the times we don't find a disease, you know? So we need to understand this very clearly because one thing is a disease, one thing is to have a pathogen because when you have a disease which is influencing the survival of a species, you have a conservation problem because if the disease is not having a significant effect on that population, so that population of losses is higher than the actual population of gain, then it's not really a disease problem. It's more of a conservation problem for that species, other species, or related species. Okay, but basically speaking, this is what I had uh, for you to uh, today for us to have this idea of the diseases within the context so that we don't just talk about and think about what are the problems, where do they come from, and then we can uh, think about the solution thinking that you know risk analysis can be a very effective uh, alternatives and then we can work on that models of associated risk analysis and methodologies okay thank you very much apollo and i do apologize for rushing and then yes and then yeah this is all very very good for you know, uh, the help and the contributions that we're making for our discussions. Eloise, are you here? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, I'm going to try and share with you. If uh, uh, I don't manage to do this, then I'm going to ask for help, okay, uh, for you to share my presentation. But the first thing is share screen, right? Okay, let's have presentation. Uh, okay, so you can see presentation. I'm a historian, right? I work with environmental history, and then within environmental history, more specifically speaking, I work with history of conservation of science related to conservation of endangered species. I work uh, with the history of protected areas. I am a professor of the University of Brasilia in the Department of History at the Sustainable Development Center. I have chosen to start my presentation to talk a little bit about the history of the biology of conservation and how within this sort of conservation biology we have arrived at the issue of this uh, rewilding, you know, reformation, if you will. So I decided to start with these five principles, which are guiding principles for conservation biology. And you will see that these are principles that can be seen as ethical, you know, in the last possible scope. In other words, diversity must be preserved and uh, untimely extinctions must be prevented, should be prevented, you know? ecological complexity should be maintained and evolutionary processes should continue. And biological diversity has intrinsic value. So this is the ethical principle really of the sort of last layer, if you will, which is going to determine the first four. We can think that biodiversity can be conserved 
due to more pragmatic sort of uh, conditions and reasons such as, you know, environmental services. But when we look at species such as the jaguar, the black dotted uh, jaguar, we have this sort of ethical observation. So who's involved in the uh, conservation of this animal? They are involved in this work because they understand that they have the right of continuing to survive as a species. And for us to get to the rewilding issue, I have gone back to before conservation biology, which is a more specific field within biology. So I decided to start with two characters. So the first one, Henry David Thoreau, who said that in wildness is the preservation of the world. So, you know, in what was not domesticated, you know, what was autonomous, Thoreau understood that he understood that that's where the preservation of our world resided and also, you know, society from a human uh, standpoint. So we were able to see a way of seeing the sort of wild life, wild sort of world, if you will, which is a bit different because you valued what you did not dominate completely. I mean, we can see that until today, we go in the opposite direction, because if we think about this as a presentation, right at the start showing how, you know, the sort of uh, wildlife species that we had, you know, 10,000 years ago and all that, and what we have as far as domesticated species, wild species today, we see that generally speaking, humanity values these species that we are able to control and that we see a more sort of direct um, service almost, you know, for society. And then another character is John Muir, very much connected to the sort of national park issues in the US. And he used to say that if a war of races should occur between the wild beasts and Lord Man. I would be tempted to sympathize with the bears, which again are the wild beasts, you know, and this is a very interesting citation because even when we think Uh, at Theodore uh, Roosevelt, who was a US president, he was an enthusiast of uh, national parks. He did a lot for national parks, actually. So he was someone who used to like hunting and he tended to see, you know, the sort of predators within the sort of uh, food chain as competitors in relation to the other sort of, you know, game species, you know, or even the other species that were being hunted. So, so this is uh, quite uh, uh, different because here in John Muir, the perception that we pick up on is that nature, generally speaking, even the wildlife had an intrinsic value. There's a very interesting passage by John Muir uh, camping with B. Forkinshaw, who was uh, the guy for natural resources conservation. And then De Fork, he was about to kill a snake, sorry, a spider, and he didn't let him. He said, no, 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 we are in its space, no, not the other way around, you know. So this is a different uh, way of seeing the sort of whole wildlife in general terms, if you will, in, in, in the wild spaces, but what prevailed uh, back then, particularly in relation to the sort of top of the food chain predators was the idea that they were farming, you know? So they were competitors in relation to, you know, other 
species that people liked hunting. They, you know, hunted domesticated herds. They did uh, present a threat to human beings. So the policy in relation to this type of fauna in the US was a policy of uh, pretty much exterminating these species. And this changes a lot with the ecologists, experts, zoologists. And then we have this uh, uh, from the fauna. And then we have some parts which are actually quite uh, important because they started showing that these sort of top of the food chain predators, they played a very important role within the ecosystems, which were also a sort of novel uh, concept. So we have Joseph Grinnell, who was a professor in California, one of the guys who worked with the concept of niche was a Victor Shelford, uh, American also. He used to work with Fauna and uh, Charles Elton from England, who is the author of the uh, concept of community. So these guys started showing how these ecosystems uh, worked above all the role of the uh, fauna, the trophic interactions. And they had a very important role when they drew attention to these uh, uh, species, you know, the top of the uh, food chain and the predators that they played a very important uh, role within nature and ecosystems. And then here we have some other very important uh, characters who are also very important. They are pioneers in relation to what we believe uh, very important for wildlife management. So we have, you know, Aldo Leopold. So Aldo Leopold, he graduated from Yale from the uh, School of Forest Engineering, which used to be sponsored by uh, Vinko Unshaw's uh, family. So, you know, as someone who studied uh, looking at natural resources, but he liked hunting a lot, you know, particularly birds, and he was very much linked to the valuing of wilderness, you know. And then as soon as he graduates, he starts working at the U.S. Forest Service and he moves to New Mexico, where he becomes one of the big authorities on game management. So, yeah, he starts working with game management particularly speaking, and he is uh, very much looking at this because he understood this as control of pests, you know, such as wolf, uh, coyotes, bears, which was this uh, sort of predator uh, animals, but he was someone who looked very much to the uh, relation between forests and water, particularly in a dry place such as new, uh, Mexico. So he starts getting more and more interested uh, on ecology. So he becomes a scholar of this field and also a researcher who uh, started publishing papers. And this, this thinking like a mountain comes from the fact that this is when he looked at wolves and saw them as pests, you know, in the forest service. And at once he killed a female wolf and the fire in her eyes as, you know, she died or something that never left his mind as well as the pops. And this later in life makes him, he rethink this uh, ecological perspective and what, is you know thinking like a mountain well you think well a mountain doesn't think does it i mean but it is the perception of the mountain as a 
ecosystem so it's to say that a lot of the times you would look at the mountain and there were all these scars that showed that you didn't have a top of the food chain predator you know the wolf and then you started having you know too much uh, trampoline and then you had these sort of footprints that showed that that ecosystem had a missing a function which was the function of the top of the food chain predator and then this guy proposes what we refer to as the land ethos and this is about looking at other species in the ecosystem as fellow travelers so this is an ecocentric perspective looking at other species and understanding their intrinsic value the other characters are adolf murray and olaus murray two brothers that worked with moose adolf uh, would work with moose and olaus with wolves they were they worked at the national park service and what later became the wildlife and fishing service in the united states and they noticed that this top of the food chain predators had beneficial effects for animals such as moose and that coyotes would not predate on moose but wolves so they would act as plague control species for those species that were considered prejudicial and they would notice what their function was. So these are the founders of this field of biology dedicated to wildlife management. This involved wildlife conservation, but also controlled intervention to balance those aspects that were unbalanced. Going forward, we have two men very important for the development of ecology, George Evelyn Hutchinson, a, a polymath that worked with lakes as ecosystem and he would use principles from chemistry and mathematics in limnology he was very well versed in zoology as well and also knew quite a bit about art so he was responsible for introducing chemistry and mathematics more systematically into ecology. And Paul Ehrlich, who is still alive, is uh, 90 years old and very much active, who worked on population ecology. Hutchinson was one of the founders of the Nature Conservancy and and guided Thomas Lovagine and MacArthur, who was a partner of Wilson. So they are, they mean a tipping point when it comes to ecology. And these are what I call the two legs of conservation biology. On the one hand, the theory of island biogeography with Edward O. Wilson and Robert MacArthur. So Wilson, which was a field biologist that worked on ants and also had a very wide viewpoint. 
a broad perspective that uh, led to the creation of sociobiology with a man from math, the math field, which was Robert MacArthur, a man who died very early. And they started looking at the relationship between the species and their area, the relation between the size of an area, the amount of species they would hold, and isolation when they look at the uh, island of biogeography. This is all at the root of the species distinction idea today. You collect habitats and uh, at the same time that you make them more isolated. So this is an important perspective when for those that cared about this, the extinction of species. And Michael Soule, who is more linked to the study of population sizes and genetics. The extinction vortex. So based on these two legs of conservation biology, we began to see biologists concern not only about their own scientific production, but also the survival of their research objects. So that led to conservation biology being created. And here, the emergence of conservation biology and the concept of biodiversity, differently from what people often think, the uh, concept of biodiversity was not always present, even though every human society knows that there is a variety of species in nature. But the concept of biodiversity really appeared first in 1985 when a forum was being organized to discuss the concern regarding a increased rate of extinction of species extinctions a sixth mass extinction so this person that was from the National Research Council and the National Academy of Sciences, Walter G. Rosen proposed the idea, the concept of biodiversity and the forum was called National Forum on Biodiversity. This was held in 1986 and it generated this biodiversity publication organized by Edward Wilson, which many are well aware of. It contains the, the texts that were presented in the forum. On the other hand, in 1985, the Conservation Biology Society was founded, or the Society for Conservation Biology. And in 1987, the first issue of Conservation Biology was published. And many of you have published text and, and works in conservation biology. And here we have the cover of one of their books. So in during the 1980s, the concern about mass extinction of a species was developed and the cons as well as the concept of biodiversity because up to that point, extinction was discussed only when concerning those more charismatic species of fauna and flora, the megafauna species like elephants and zebras or and many top of the chain predators that were now consider, considered important, but not under a mass extinction perspective. So the, the viewpoint was always uh, focused on these uh, on certain 
species of fauna and flora, such as the um, Araucaria here in Brazil. So in 1992, this all led to the Convention on Biodiversity and the idea of species, ecosystems, and genus. And these are here the, the color books, books organized by Michael Soleil. And this really shaped conservation biology as a applied discipline. And as he said, a discipline that was founded to deal with a crisis, the extinction crisis. This is the first collection, conservation biology. It had a, a title that uh, related to evolution and how that affected the, the, the species. This is a, an 86, 87 issue, conservation biology, the science of scarcity and diversity. And in the same year, Viable Populations for Conservation was published. So there we had the two legs of biology conservation. The bo this blue book showed a, a great concern regarding genetics and populations. And the other one had a uh, more uh, varied subjects and talked about fragmentation quite a lot and edge effect and or border effect. And this one discussed priorities for conservation biology. And this green book that was the uh, really the, the starting point for rewilding, a book organized by Soleil and John Turbock called Continental Conservation. You can see the map of the United States there. So the idea was to think about conservation in a wider with a wider scope in a regional or continental view. And you can see a top of the food chain predator there, a wolf. And there we um, began to think not only about conservation in wild areas and more preserved areas, but also how we could have a network of protected areas that were at the same time connected to allow species to survive and even to reintroduce top of the food chain predators and large herbivores. So at that point, we began to think that not only preserving wild areas was important, but also human intervention was key to ensure connectivity and to make populations viable in these areas all over the continent. This is another series of papers, collected papers of Michael Soule, in which uh, he discussed the concept of rewilding. And the key species concept, which would be uh, mainly the top of the chain predators, those species with small populations that played an essential role within ecosystems. They would regulate, for instance, the size of ungulate populations. Therefore, they that was a top-down control and species with larger populations that interacted quite a lot with the ecosystems and that were essential for their ecosystems. You have, for instance, the wolf 
as an example of these smaller sized populations and the bison, larger populations who also play a very important role in their ecosystems by trampling on the soil and really predating on the pastures. They are what we can call environmental engineers shaping their environment and and are really important for the relationship between uh, predators and prey. When we discuss extinction or the reintroduction of species, uh, rewilding and refaunation, it is important to think about the relationship between these species in protected areas. And we must think about them not as isolated areas, but as connected environments. I picked two book covers that address the importance of protected areas for conservation of species, protecting the wild, parks and wilderness, the foundation for conservation. This is also a collection of essays and it discusses the idea of what we of the new conservation concept that we uh, know about today, that the conservation of species is not that important. What it is really important are ecosystem services that um, not always are offered by wild areas. And also the book by Edward Wilson called Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life, an attempt to argue for more area. When we look at the um, Convention on Biodiversity, we ask ourselves how much protected areas we need. There is a debate also uh, that tries to define what a protected area is. If there is people within it, if it's an indigenous land. So if you think about half of the earth being protected, many times you're, you're thinking about occupied areas, human occupied areas. However, with the coexistence with top of the food chain predators, ungulates, which are the species that really based the concept of rewilding or refaunation. Five minutes left. Yes, I am closing. Here, the projects of rewilding and conflicts. Here, the California condor that uh, was object of, of debate in the United States regarding the hands-on or hands-off, if you really should intervene with the species or not, or some people thought that they would they needed to be left in their environment but they would be uh hunted and um poisoned with a, a coyote poison and then they started to capture these individuals to and try to reproduce them in captivity and today we have some successful projects in that sense this is the mauritius island eagle and a welshman went there to close the program down and they started to uh, breed them in captivity and then release them into the nature and that worked here the bisons there are people who talk about the reintroduction of bisons and we have some projects on that in the United States and wolves. We have that famous Yellowstone project, for instance. These are the Atlantic forest projects, the, uh, the golden lion tamarind and the uh, black beak toucan, both projects 
initiated by Ademar Coimbra, who passed away some years ago, but were very successful. And this is interesting because here we didn't discuss really if we would uh, we should intervene with the with these animals in nature. That he just did and was successful. And for the ones that Fernando showed us that are being reintroduced in Tijuca and they tapir. We can see that these are, I was watching a program that talked about aggressive uh, tortoises and um, they were aggressive and, and no one really worried about that. If it were jaguars or peccaries, maybe, but not tortoises because they, they can't run really and they have no teeth. And these are now animals that are being reintroduced in this area, the Iberá area, a very interesting project that tries to reconstitute an entire fauna. So trying to understand what will eventually happen there is very interesting and very important. And what about the white-lipped peccaries? What should we do about them? differently from the tortoises that are territorial, a group of, of peccaries defending their territory uh, is object of concern. So how to reintroduce an animal that is um, threatened of extinction in their natural habitat? Also, convergences, endangered Species Act and Wilderness Act. This is a, an interesting convergence in the United States because you have two laws. The uh, Wilderness Act created in the Fishing and Wildlife Service and the Park Services and the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. So you have wild areas or wilderness areas and this is a 1964 Act and the Endangered Species Act, the 1973 Act with that um, puts forward a list of endangered species. And why are they convergent? Because when we have endangered species, the immediate action is to ensure their survival by creating wilderness areas. Also, the Conservation Biology and Deep Ecology by Michael Soleil who was very close to the deep ecology crew. We have in one of those color books, Arn Ness participated as well as, and David, Dave Foreman and Michael Soule became very close when discussing rewilding. So here there is a book by David Foreman. And here, is the idea that biodiversity has an intrinsic value. And we go back to Aldo Leopold, a Sand County almanac, in which he uh, clearly uh, states this idea. And this is a very strong basis for the idea of containing the mass extinction wave. And to do that, we need to work on different ethical principles. In other words, to really provide citizenship status to other species besides humans. Of course, there are other more pragmatic arguments. Because I understand that conservation in the end of the day is justified by an ethical or a broader ethical perspective in which empathy and ethical considerations are extended to other species. Because environmental services can be offered by 
other ecosystems besides wilderness areas. And that's what new conservation is about, that wild species are not that important and that we can keep the planet alive as a sort of garden what was called the arrogance of humanism, the idea of a world completely domesticated by humankind. A world that can be completely controlled by humans. Of course, David Ehrenfeld talked about this, the, the arrogance of humanism, and he shows how many of these projects in which humans play God show uh, or generate many failures such as uh, agrochemicals, atomic energy, and maybe the uh, a, a criticism to the idea of treating the planet as a garden. And we go back to that idea that the saving the world is only possible with wilderness and our capacity to really uh, deal with that which we don't completely dominate. And a final aspect of my presentation is that when we think about rewilding and refaunation and restoring species and ecosystems, this must all be thought about as a partnership between humans and nature, because we can't predict all risks and consequences. We are constantly facing paradoxes, which is managing that which is wild and is independent from us. But at the same time, we were the ones that created the situation. So we are constantly walking the tightrope, trying to understand that restoring areas that it were highly impacted by humans must imply a partnership with nature and we must also learn from nature in that sense i remember when i work with the ip people when they try to restore and they had uh, the, uh, a corridor restoration project in the pontal do paranapanema and that wasn't a refaunation project this was a, re a rest restoration and but that was based on fauna. So it's quite interesting to think about that. And here we have a, a species of jaguar to close the presentation. And once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, José Luis, and very good thoughts and reflections. We need to really know on whose shoulders we stand to know what we can achieve. I can't find the unsharing button. Thank you. Então, fechando o nosso dia, fechando o nosso bloco, a gente teve aí as três participações da Selene, do Paulo. So, um, we had Selene, Paulo, and José Luis in the final part of our workshop today. And I want to know if there are questions. Someone had uh, raised their hand, but uh, I don't know who that was. No show of hands here. 
on the chat there is a comment by Ronaldo to Selene asking if after the release if they would uh, have a soft release or well Ronaldo's not here but yes I wrote on the chat after I saw the question that yes we will carry out a soft release they are first trained in the laboratory and then they are taken to a pre-release area uh, a larger area in the forest where we build fences and then we start to install the feeders inside and also outside so they are then released and they have they're wearing colors as well and are well identified and in each in each feeder there will be also a, a mechanism for identifying the individuals that fed from them rafael oh um thanks can you hear me well I, uh, sorry my question was for uh paulo rogerio rogerio um, can I can I do that now? Sorry. Oh, oh I wait. You can do. Oh, yeah, go okay. ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's Paulo Roger. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Here is raining in Mexico. Um, is is the African swine fever able to to be transmitted to peccaries? Do you have any information about the African swine so, fever? No. Um. No, in South America, it's not present. So the sort of surveys that we have done, we have not found it, but this was not the most researched disease in this sort of quick survey that I've done. We do have some work with peccaries in South America that look for diseases. Some of the diseases have never been found, as I pointed out in uh, one of the slides, and some have but the sort of swine plague no no so we've not had that at all um, we've not really had any outbreak or anything that indicates its presence as far as we know and i think that this is a big hurdle because we do have some information about some small outbreaks as far as uh, uh, mortality in wildlife some in captivity and sometimes we have no answer of what would be a potentially important disease for the species such as peccary that could actually be regulating population in the wild, but we do not have this information very clear. And then in all the different papers that I was able to survey in a short amount of time, I have maybe one, maybe two uh, that address clinical manifestation, one, two, maybe three isolated cases where you're unable to reach the sort of uh, epidemiological importance on the population. So you would really have to uh, uh, endeavor a lot and would be actually quite costly for you to be able to model it in the way that we've been modeling it. Thank you very much. Obrigado. De nada. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody else? No? I've not seen any comments on chat, so I would just like to ask everyone to open their uh, cameras for us to be able to make a quick sort of uh, record of the event. I'm going to take a quick registry. Okay, so we have two screens. Okay, so I'm going to wait uh, for it to uh, get filled up because I have two uh, screens full of people. And then and then cheese does it work in both languages if i go cheese yes because i'm going to take a picture and just another one okay just a second one more cheese okay okay Okay, everyone, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, our interpreters who really, uh, you know, had to, to do this very difficult uh, 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 task, very fast presentation with a lot of sort of technical terms, with a lot of information that for uh, translation is a reasonably uh, 
challenge. Thank you very much, Pedro. And thank you very much, Chris. And then, of course, I'd like to thank all of you for your attendance today. I think that in our first day, we are building an important stage for the planning of translocation for the three species that this event, you know, attempts to uh, discuss, which is the tapirs, um, the Pantanal deers, and the peccaries. You're all free, okay? Um, you can send the YouTube uh, link, the internet link for anyone who you want to watch. Uh, anything we had some problem with the broadcast in english but the links they're all there so all you need to do is watch them one afterwards uh, one after the other the live apparently dropped out a couple of times but i don't think that there's a lot lost there so i'd like to thank you very much uh those of you on the internet thank you for being with us thank you very much you know for going into our youtube uh, channel and that's it so we'll continue uh, for tomorrow, thank all the speakers, all the attendees, and to our supporters, thank you very much, the U.S. Forest Service and USAID, for your support, you know, for the staging of this event. Thank you very much. I uh, wish everyone gets a good rest, and I'll see you all tomorrow. See you later. See you tomorrow. Boa tarde para todos. Até amanhã. Tchau, tchau. Obrigada. Tchau, pessoal. Obrigada. Foi muito bom. Pode interromper a live se ainda não tiver interrompido. E aí a gente continua um pouquinho, né, Marcelo?